Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our National Safe Work Month webinar. Safe Work SA presents uh, South Australia's psychosocial regulations, lessons learnt, and practical advice. My name is Jason Mavrikis. I'm the Chief Advisor of Psychosocial at Safe Work SA. I'll be hosting this morning's webinar. Uh, but before we uh, go any further, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge this land that we meet on today is the traditional lands for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. We also pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people attending from other areas of South Australia or Australia. We have an exciting lineup of presenters today as a part of uh, our webinar, and I'd like to introduce you firstly to our colleague, Marty Weber. Marty is uh, an incredibly experienced registered psychologist. She's also a Return to Work SA's Mentally Healthy Workplaces Consultant. So welcome, Marty, and Marty will be speaking uh, firstly today. From Safe Work SA, we have Sam Atkins, who is also uh, an incredibly experienced registered psychologist. She's our Principal Inspector of Organisational Psychology. So welcome to Sam. Sam will be following Marty. And our third presenter and final speaker will be Pam Murray. Pam Murray, again, is a very experienced psychosocial inspector at Safe Work SA. She forms part of our psychosocial and industrial team. And Pam will be finishing up uh, the three presenters as, as a part of today's webinar. So welcome, Pam. Before we go any further, uh, we'd like to provide a content warning on the, the contents of today's webinar. And I'd like to pass over to my colleague, Sam, uh, to provide a, a bit of a, an overview of the content. Thanks, Sam. No worries, yeah. Look, um, with the webinar today, um, we'll be talking about, um, you know, the topic of managing psychosocial health and safety in workplaces, um, talking about the imperative behind it, um, what we uh, as a regulator looks for, um, and giving you a bit of insight into how we go about that as well. So, um, you know, we've, we've kept the, the content quite benign. We're not going to be talking about um, specific cases um, and, you know, talking about, um, you know, uh, mental health topics that some people might find a bit challenging. So, um, but in saying that, um, if, if you anticipate that you may find um, any of the content, um, you know, causes you more than discomfort, then, um, you know, you, you're very, you know, welcome to opt out um, at any stage of the webinar um, and seek out your preferred supports. Okay, thanks, Sam. In terms of the structure of today's webinar, as I mentioned, first up, we have our colleague Marty Weber from Return to Work SA. Uh, we've, we've listed the contents of Marty's component of the webinar there. I won't read through them all. But as you can see, Marty's covering off on things like the health benefits of good work, uh, the why, uh, organisational culture, leadership commitment, and so on. Secondly, Sam Atkins will be speaking about uh, the things that we are learning and seeing about psychosocial risk in South Australian workplaces, uh, how to go about managing psychosocial risk in workplaces, applying the risk management process, and then looking beyond compliance. And thirdly, Pam will be looking at the process for a Safe Work SA psychosocial hazard request for service, essentially our complaint process. Uh, she'll be looking at practical examples of safe systems of work and we'll then be finishing up with a bit of a wrap up, lessons learnt and practical advice that you can take away from today's webinar. Okay, so first up, Marty, I'd like to hand over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people online today, and I just think it shows the interest in this area. So thank you for joining us. Um, for those that aren't familiar, Return to Work SA, we're responsible for providing work injury insurance and regulating the South Australian Return to Work Scheme. Uh, I've been in my role as Mentally Healthy Workplace Consultant at Return to Work SA for the last eight and a half years. Uh, we provide free advice and assistance to workplaces that want to know more about <clears throat> creating a mentally healthy workplace. So 
my um, contact details are at the end of the session. So if you want to learn more, or more about our service, please get in contact us or send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Um, just a personal reflection is that um, in relation to since the psychosocial regulations came out, our service has never been so popular or uh, in so much demand. We've really um, seen a huge interest in workplaces want to, wanting to create a mentally healthy workplace, but in particular around, um, you know, what are their obligations in relation to managing psychosocial hazards and risks and up, looking at upskilling leadership and workforce in this area. I think this is a really positive and encouraging sign and there appears to be a real desire uh, for workplaces to take action. So I know that Sam and Pam are going to particularly focus on uh, the legislative obligations, uh, but I wanted to start off with uh, by talking about some of the broader business benefits of focusing on psychosocial hazards and risks and providing that positive and supportive workplace environment. If you're still seeking buy-in from your workplace in relation to this, uh, I think considering sort of these broader uh, business benefits uh, can be uh, quite a useful thing to consider. Thanks, Jason. So I wanted to start by just talking about the health benefits of good work. We do spend about a third of our lives at work. It can be very influential when it comes to our health and well-being, both from a negative or a, a positive perspective. And today we're focusing on psychosocial hazards and risks. Um, and we know that these hazards do have the potential to cause harm in the workplace, harm to both physical and psychological health. However, there's increasing evidence that if we're actually in well-designed and well-managed work, uh, work can actually be a protective factor uh, for our health. And so I think this is really important to keep in mind because you think about all the things that work can actually bring um, to, uh, to us. It can bring us that structure, physical activity, um, <clears throat> community and social connection, financial security, opportunities to grow and develop and make those valuable contributions. So <clears throat> we want to create work environments where people can realise these health benefits of work. And managing psychosocial hazards and risks is an essential element of actually being able to realise these health benefits. Thanks, Jason. So I uh, speak to, in my role, I speak to a lot of workplaces uh, around um, managing psychosocial hazards and risks, uh, mentally healthy workplaces. And um, workplaces actually have many reasons why uh, they think it's important. So I just wanted to go through some of those whys um, and I guess for you to consider what your why is within your workplace as well. Certainly meeting legislative compliance and with the introduction of the new psychosocial legislation in December, you know, has been a really huge driver for workplaces. But it's also the genuine uh, reason of actually about caring for people within the workplace and creating a safer workplace that protects workers from harm, both physical and psychological harm. We know that from a uh, Return to Work SA perspective, we, we monitor work injury claims and we know that nationally and in South Australia, we are seeing an increase in work-related psychological injury claims. And we know that these claims can result in longer recovery times, higher costs and more time away from work than physical injuries. So we really do want to focus on psychosocial hazards and risks and be, prevent people from harm uh, within the workplace. There's also really great business benefits. There can be a, a really healthy return on investment for those workplaces that focus on psychosocial hazards and risks. And that can be through reduced absenteeism, reduced work injury claims, but also reduced presenteeism. So presenteeism is where if we've got workers that are stressed and struggling, um, it's very hard to be productive so or as productive as you can be. 
So presenteeism, yeah, it's really that aspect of it. So we've got a, a great work environment. We've got a work environment where people aren't stressed. It means that there's going to be that reduction in presenteeism and that increase in productivity. The other thing is we're actually creating really good working conditions and a great place to work when we're actually focusing on, on effectively addressing psychosocial hazards and risks. So that is going to positively impact the workplace around workplace reputation and becoming that employer of choice. And in our current economic climate where there is a skill shortage, actually having a workplace that attracts and retains staff is a huge business benefit. And finally, improved organisational culture. So workplaces that do um, focus on psychosocial hazards and risks are creating more healthy work cultures that support collaboration, open communication, respect, inclusion, opportunities to grow and develop, but also recognition of work achievements where people actually feel valued at work for the for their work contributions. So there's many reasons why. You may have more reasons uh, in relation to your why for your workplace as well. Thanks, Jason. So we talked about culture and the improvement of workplace culture. I just wanted to elaborate and just say that when we're thinking about organisational culture, it is the values and behaviours that workers share and show. Their shared attitudes and belief in workplaces written and unwritten rules. And I guess a simple way to say it's the way we do things around here. Um, and just Jason, next point, please. And leaders play a vital role in the culture of the workplace. So if workers know their leaders place high importance on health and safety, it becomes everyday part of work. And it also builds this really positive workplace culture. So that if workers report psychosocial hazards or if they're filling out a survey, there's really that belief that action will be taken and we will be working together to resolve these issues within our workplace. Thanks, Jason. So um, I guess a key learning around psychosocial hazards and risks is that an essential element is leadership. And you can see that in the risk management framework, you can see management commitment bang in the middle. And there really needs to be this genuine commitment by leaders and managers to effectively address psychosocial hazards and risks. Now, you may already have leadership commitment in place. You may be a leader listening online today. It's important for leadership to really understand why it's important for your workplace. Uh, we talked about the, the legislative obligations, but also those broader uh, business benefits as well. Thanks, Jason. Next slide. So how, what does showing leadership commitment look like? And I'll just get you to step through these dot points with me, Jason. Um, certainly it's around setting WHS as a business priority and communicating this across the business. Really importantly, it's for leaders to understand their WHS duties in relation to psychosocial matters. So officers do have a duty to exercise due diligence around psychosocial hazards and risks. And so this means it's a really positive and proactive duty requiring officers to really probe and seek out information so that they can make informed decisions uh, to address psychosocial hazards and risks. And if you are looking for more information around due diligence, I really recommend um, Safe Work Australia has a great interpretive guideline in this area. It's ensuring your WHS management system addresses both physical and psychosocial issues. And it's also recognising various roles within the business that can contribute. Managing psychosocial hazards and risk, it can't be done in isolation or in silos. It means that the workplace has to come together, recognise the various roles that can contribute uh, to effectively managing these risks. Now, if you're a large workplace, you might have a separate health and safety HR department. Uh, you might have uh, elected health and safety representatives. So you all need to come together to look at how uh, issues can be addressed. If you're a smaller workplace, it's about leaders and workers coming together to talk about 
and, and discuss these issues uh, within the workplace as well. It's about consulting with workers, which we've just talked about, allocating the necessary resources. And finally, for leaders, they need to be a positive role model through everyday workplace practices and behaviours. So that means if we're rolling out respectful behaviour policies and procedures, then leaders need to be showing that respectful behaviour uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I talk about, when I talk about mentally healthy workplaces, I talk about mentally healthy workplace behaviours and that leaders really need to be role modelling these behaviours. So what do I mean by that? It's about being approachable. It's about listening. It's about being empathetic. It's about su being supportive, a supportive leader. And it's also about leaders role modelling that they actually do care for their own health and well-being as well. So showing that, that self-care as well. And the other learning is that an essential element for effectively managing psychosocial hazards and risks is consulting with workers. Now, Consultation is a legislative com um, compliance obligation, obviously, um, but we really need genuine consultation because we need to get an understanding of work. What's going well with work? What's not, what, what's not going so well? What are the areas that are causing work-related stress where it may be excessive and ongoing and that could cause harm? Um, so it is a legislative obligation, but it also makes a better decision making by directly consulting with workers that are affected by the hazards. Um, I've just stepped out the four steps to effective consultation. And uh, I think the important part of it is around sharing information with workers around the hazards or working conditions or changes, giving an opportunity for workers to be able to express their views before decisions are made. And then once, so the management can consider all those issues. Uh, and then once a decision is made, actually to advise workers on the outcome in a timely manner. Thanks, Jason. So Jason, I'll just get you to step through these dot points as well. So effective consultation means providing different avenues for workers to be consulted. Now, you might have agreed procedures. Again, if you're a, bigger, a part of a bigger organisation, you might have a consultative committee, a WHS committee, you might have elected health and safety representatives. It may be if you're a smaller work workplace, it's just around that really good one-on-one -on -one consultation with staff through toolbox talks. It's about being inclusive as well. So considering the diversity of your workforce when you are looking at consultation, are there at-risk groups within your workplace that we really need to seek out and make sure that we're consulting with those at-risk groups? So it could be um, uh, people such as um, uh, new workers, young workers, uh, it could be remote workers where we really need to make sure that they're feeling like they're being supported in the, in the work that they do. It's about having frank and open conversations to better understand how work is really done, uh, which might be different from job descriptions or standard operating procedures which are in place. And it's listening and recognising the different ways workers will talk about psychosocial hazards. And I've given you the infographic from Safe Work Australia. I really love this infographic because it talks about how workers may describe work that identifies that psychosocial issues are there. So they may describe work as this place is toxic or I'm just stressed uh, or burnt out because of my workloads, or perhaps there's change that's happened in the workplace and now I feel really confused about what I'm meant to be doing within the workplace. So it's about listening to workers, understanding how they're describing work, and really trying to find out what the source of those work-related stresses are. It's taking issues seriously, uh, and it's about looking at those workplace factors rather than blaming an individual or focusing on the individual uh, as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit more further down the track. And building psychological safety so employees feel safe to talk openly. Now, when we're talking about psychological safety, what that term means, it's a belief that one will not be punished, humiliated or uh, for speaking up with ideas, 
questions, concerns or mistakes. So when we're talking about psychosocial hazards and risks, we need really need that psychological safety. So employees feel safe to be able to openly report and talk about psychosocial hazards and risks within the workplace. Thanks, Jason. So this week is uh, obviously second week of Safe Work Month and Safe Work Australia has got some great resources on their website. And so I had a look at some of the resources for week two and I really love this myth buster because I think it's a really key learning around psychosocial hazards and risks. And that key learning is that we need to focus on workplace factors and not just individuals within the workplace. So the myth is, well, you know, if someone's not coping, well, workers just need to toughen up. Uh, we just need to change how they react to the problem, or maybe we just need to run some resilience training. Actually, the fact is that psychosocial hazards can, calm, can harm anyone. And instead of trying to change how workers respond to psychosocial hazards, we actually need to look at work. So we need to think about the source of harm. You know, what is the direct cause of work-related stress? And is it the way work is designed or managed or is it our physical work environment? What are those sources of stress? And I know Sam will be talking about the hierarchy of control and the highest level of protection. So that's what we need to focus on rather than just looking at those individual strategies. Thanks, Jason. And final, my final, I guess, learning is that, and it really comes back to my first point, and that is that workplaces are really seeking out information around psychosocial hazards and risks to upskill and to really think about how can we take effective action. So we're absolutely delighted, Safe Work SA and Return to Work SA are absolutely delighted that we can offer you a free online module that has been developed in conjunction with GPEX, uh, uh, which is managing psychosocial hazards and risks in the workplace, completely free. You can QR code, you can log in, you can register. And it's a one hour module uh, for leaders, any leaders, health and safety reps, WHS people, HR people, anyone that's really got an interest. Um, and you, it goes through uh, what are psychosocial hazards and risks, how to address it using the risk management framework and lots of free tools and resources that are available. So we really hope that you can um, download that. Thank you very much. And we'd love your feedback. So please give us some feedback around that. So that's it for me. Um, I do need to leave the webinar now because of uh, just some other um, uh, issues that I need to attend to. Uh, but I just wanted to say thanks, everyone, for listening. If you do want to connect with me after the session, you will see my contact details at the end. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much, Marty. Uh, you've offered our audience a, a range of very useful information, advice and support there. So thank you. In response to uh, a few questions that have been posed in the chat, I'd just like to uh, note that we will be uh, making the recording of this morning's webinar available uh, and that will be published on our official Safe Work SA YouTube account. In addition, uh, towards the end of the webinar, we've allowed for a brief period of questions and answers. So if you do have questions, please feel free to send them through on the chat. Uh, and given that we only have a brief period of time to respond to them, we may only get uh, to a few. Uh, but any further questions, uh, you're welcome to email them through to us. We will feature the email address towards the end. It is help.safework.sa.gov.au. Thanks again, Marty. So now I'd like to hand over to Sam Atkins. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Jason. So, um, look, um, you know, in terms of, you know, um, you know, what we've learned about um, how um, South Australian PCBUs are, are tracking with managing psychosocial risks in workplaces, it really, um, you know, similar to what um, Marty has mentioned earlier, um, we're seeing um, a lot of good understanding about the why. 
um, you know, what the imperative is. Um, there's a really good understanding of the relationship between um, work um, and health um, and an understanding that, you know, um, good quality work with favourable conditions um, is good for people's health and not, you know, their physical and mental health. So that's really positive and there is a very genuine interest in learning about psychosocial health and safety um, and, you know, workers seem to be, you know, pretty um, switched on with, you know, identifying stresses within their workplaces and feeling pretty empowered about speaking up about them and, and, and coming um, to either us or going internally um, to raise their concerns. Um, look, in contrast to that, um, I think uh, one big challenge for um, uh, businesses and organisations is really identifying the hazards because um, it's pretty tricky because hazards are psychosocial hazards, um, you know, they're, they're pretty qualitative in nature. It can be really difficult to sort of work out, well, is, is this a harmful behaviour like bullying or harassment? Um, what does low support look like? Um, how do I know when change management is being done poorly, you know? So it is a pretty qualitative judgment that people have to make. Um, so I really want to highlight that investing time um, in hazard identification um, does require a bit of investment um, and be patient with it. Be very curious and ask lots of questions um, about what's going on in your organisation. Um, ask yourself, is there a pattern here? Um, what sort of negative impact might this have for workers if this situation um, persists? Um, so things like that and, and be really open-minded about what you're looking at. Um, as, as Marty um, mentioned before, and we really want organisations and businesses to really focus on the causes of work-related stress. Um, that's something that we do look at as a regulator. Um, it's, it's really great that organisations care very much about investing in um, workplace mental health. But what we want them to try and think about is um, it's about focusing on the hazards and addressing the hazards and minimising risk for workers. Um, so that's really, really important. We want them um, to sort of look upstream a little bit um, and think about the sources of stress and directly targeting those. Um, lots of organisations and businesses um, have a pretty decent suite of policies and procedures, you know, particularly in relation to um, workplace behaviours. Um, but obviously their value is, is really dependent on how well implemented they are, um, how much workers understand them, um, how much um, workers are behaving in a manner that's consistent with those policies and procedures and that they're regularly reviewed and maintained. So um, I have a nice saying, um, you know, um, just remember that, you know, policies, are, they're kind of inert things, um, they're administrative measures, um, and remember that policies don't make decisions, human beings do, okay? So, um, you know, often um, on their own, they're not, <clears throat> they're not sufficient. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, now, uh, Marty spoke about um, due diligence earlier, and I really want to highlight there that um, it's important for anyone in a leadership or management role to reflect on their own leadership style, okay, because the style of leadership or management that um, you have might either be protecting workers um, or putting them at risk. Um, so it's, you know, the research shows that democratic and consultative leadership styles are quite protective um, for workers. Um, and in contrast to that, the autocratic, authoritarian and laissez-faire styles, and laissez-faire, I mean um, hands-off, um, they can be root causes of psychosocial risk. So for those people in leadership and management roles, um, do some self-reflection on your own style and ask yourself whether that you're actually, in, you know, in your everyday behaviours are actually protecting your workers. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Right, so look, um, what we look for um, is evidence that businesses and organisations are following the four steps, okay? So um, we look for evidence that you've taken time to identify hazards, assess risks, 
um, have implemented appropriate control measures and, and that you're reviewing them and assessing um, whether they're effective and fit for purpose. So um, we do look at that um, at the macro level. Um, we want to see evidence also that you've consulted with your workers throughout those four steps. So I think someone earlier had asked, well, you know, how often should you consult with workers? And really it's consulting with them throughout that four step process. So treating them as trusted partners. So the identifying hazards and assessing risk steps. Um, look, it's not overly prescriptive as to how you go about that. What is most important is that you're demonstrating that you've consulted with your workers. Um, you may decide to use a risk assessment tool, and I'll talk about those briefly in a moment. Um, direct observation about what's going on in your, in your workplace and being curious and asking questions. Um, and if you've got any workforce data, have a look at it and, and do some analysis, um, you know, to get a sense of what sort of story that might be telling you about what's going on in the workplace. Um, look, a lot of those examples there, they'll give you an indication about um, the impact um, that work-related stresses may be having on workers. So it's important to sort of then, you know, do that further um, analysis, you know, going past the first layer of the onion and thinking about, well, what does this tell us um, about the nature of hazards in the workplace? Thank you. So risk assessment tools, um, look, there's there's quite a few around. Um, there's a couple there that I've got there. Um, you can see um, the People at Work survey uh, and the Affirm Toolkit. Um, look, they're free, but there's also a lot of other um, tools um, out there um, that are commercially available. Um, you know, have a think about what's right for your business or organisation because, um, look, really none of them are absolutely perfect. Um, so have a think about, you know, whether it's right for you. But look, you know, think about whether it's assessing um, a, a really broad range of hazards, perhaps whether hazards interact, um, the health um, um, status of your workers, um, you know, whether it's, you know, even assessing protective factors, which can be a really big benefit. Um, but the People at Work survey there, that, that one, that's a fairly well-known one, obviously. It's been around since 2015, um, and that was developed by the University of Queensland um, in conjunction with um, Australia's work health and safety regulators. So it, it focuses on psychosocial hazards and, um, and measuring psychological distress. Um, and then there's one there called the Affirm Toolkit. Now, that stand, this is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's called a participative hazard identification and risk management toolkit. Um, and so that's a great toolkit to use um, if you're interested um, in assessing um, not just psychosocial hazards, but also um, manual handling hazards um, and physical and psychological health. So I reckon that's a pretty good one uh, for you know, using, um, say for example, in the healthcare and social assistance um, industry. So you can see up there, there's, you know, in terms of strengths, you know, they do produce automated reports. They're pretty quick and easy um, to, to complete um, and come with a range of guidance materials um, that sort of gets you on your way with doing a good risk assessment. Um, but there are some limitations there and they don't assess all hazards um, or how they interact, okay? So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, look, we've got some other information about um, risk management tools um, on our website, so go and have a look there. Um, and just on that previous slide, there was a link there to um, a New South Wales government report that was published back in 2021. Um, at the back end of that, there's an appendix that covers off on a range of risk assessment tools, um, not just for psychosocial um, hazards, but also for manual handling hazards as well. And I, I actually found that quite useful. So if you want to have a look at that, that might be um, worth your time. Thanks, Jason. Right, so step three is controlling risks. And um, here's what we look for. Um, so wherever possible, wherever is reasonably practicable, um, invest in primary prevention um, as much as you can. And just think of the administrative and PPE measures, or what we call personal protective measures or resources, as kind of uh, supplementary or complementary measures or sort of fallbacks. Um, so we've got an example um, of a hierarchy of psychosocial hazard controls there. Um, and you can see there in those green fields, I mean, they're the ones that 
um, those those um, control measures, um, they're the ones that you know are the most um, sort of effective. Um, and so we want organisations to be implementing those types of controls um, as much as they can, because they're the ones that we consider to be sort of the primary measures and they target the systems of work. In contrast to that, you've got things like um, you know, secondary measures or administrative measures, which are largely things like policies and procedures and, and training and education. Um, and then you've got, you know, your tertiary measures down the bottom there, things like um, EAP counselling services, return to work program. Um, an example of a higher order control would be um, setting very reasonable um, performance standards or productivity standards for your workers, depending on um, the number of workers that you have and their skills, knowledge and attributes and, and doing that in a quite deliberate way. Um, under our legislation, there are a range of factors that you need to take into consideration um, when selecting your controls. And, and look, they're the sort of the key ones there um, that you would need to be thinking about. So, you know, if workers are exposed to hazards um, at a high frequency or for long durations, or it's quite high impact exposure, for example, that would justify um, implementing higher order controls as much as he can. Thank you. So controlling the risks of harmful behaviours. Now, that's a, a I, I, when I say harmful behaviours, I mean um, things like um, bullying or sexual harassment, um, violence and aggression, um, and interpersonal conflicts in the workplace. So I'm often asked, well, you know, what are the really big things that um, organisations and businesses should be doing? Um, well, look, there's lots that you can do, but at, at the very basic level, it's, it's about ensuring that your workers are aware of their legal protections on the various items of legislation. Um, really going through that process of reinforcing expected values and behaviours throughout the employment life cycle. Um, because consistent and proportionate sanctions um, against instigators of harmful behaviours has been identified as a very strong predictor of satisfaction with organisational responses to harmful behaviours. But on the flip side, it's equally important to reward um, and reinforce workers who engage in um, pro-social um, and productive and constructive behaviour um, in, the, in the, the workplace that's consistent with the organisation's values. Making sure that you're giving um, good levels of support um, for complainants and complaint respondents, balancing the procedural response with the human response, and give people reasonable information about complaints processes and outcomes to cover off on that organisational justice um, um, imperative. And as much as you can, address the risk factors, because that, that, if you're really going to be very preventative about it, um, reduce um, sources of role ambiguity, role conflict, focus on reducing excessive work demands and for leaders and managers, um, engage in um, democratic and consultative styles of leadership. Um, they're the things that reduce um, the risk of harmful behaviours in workplaces. Sam, just briefly before we go on, we've had a question pop up in the chat from Brendan uh, with regards to your last point there on leadership style. Brendan asks, what if you have senior leaders who are oblivious to or unwilling to change their leadership style? Um, what action could be taken in response to that? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a really big question. Um, Look, um, you know, that's one where, look, a yeah, potential control measure, like thinking about this from a work health and safety perspective, is um, now workers have a right to be consulted um, about work health and safety measures. So as workers, if you're concerned um, about um, the behaviour um, of, of senior leaders in an organisation, um, you know, you can say um, we wouldn't want some control measures for that. So it might be saying we would like um, them to, you know, receive some education and training about um, better leadership and management styles. Um, we want to have um, better worker feedback um, mechanisms, um, you know, between workers and their senior leaders, for example. So, um, and actually, that's a really good question because I'm going to just talk about um, step four in a moment where um, that's about reviewing control measures. Um, 
So if we just pop to that one now, Jason, if, if we could. Um, so at that bottom point there, um, workers um, can ask um, that control measures be reviewed. Um, so that is step four. Um, that's another thing that we look at. Um, so, you know, or a HSR or a health and safety representative can do that as well. So you can talk to your health and safety representative um, if you have one um, and ask that that be done and raise your concerns um, through them. So, you know, um, linking into that question, you know, if you're seeing signs that existing measures aren't effective or adequate, um, you know, speak up about that and ask for those review, you know, ask for control measures to be reviewed. Okay, and if you're seeing major changes um, in your workplace that might give rise to new um, sources of stress, you know, like a, a major structural or functional change, for example, um, you know, that's another reason um, to be reviewing your control measures. And it's just good practice to be doing that. So just um, circling back a little bit to um, the point that, that Marty um, made before um, is a thinking beyond compliance. So look, going through those four steps is really an opportunity for businesses and organisations to address weak spots um, in their organisational systems. So, um, you know, she talked a lot about, um, you know, thinking beyond um, just meeting, um, you know, your legal obligations and thinking about what's good um, for your organisation or business's um, sustainability. Okay, so that little diagram there gives you a bit of a sense of, you know, thinking about what sort of weaknesses in your system um, exist and, you know, could they be root causes of psychosocial hazards. Thank you. That's it. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sam. You've offered us some fascinating insights there. And uh, we appreciate it very much. Just responding to some questions in the chat. Yes, uh, just to reiterate, this webinar is recorded and sans the technical glitch that was featured earlier, we will upload it to our official Safe Work SA YouTube channel. Uh, we are also happy to provide uh, PDF prints of the presentation itself to attendees. We're happy to send them out. A uh, question was asked with regards to the hierarchy of risk control that Sam talked to and we featured earlier. Uh, that will be on our website. In fact, it is yes. currently. Uh, and the website content was just recently launched and is now available. And I believe a link to it was popped in the chat earlier. So now I'd like to hand over to our colleague, Pam Murray. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, Marty and Sam. So my uh, role here at Safe Work SA is a work health safety inspector and my team covers psychosocial and industrial matters. So in answer to the question that we had a bit earlier, this first section will probably apply to um, the person that asked the question. So I'm going to cover off on the process for when someone wants to raise a psychological uh, concern with Safe Work SA. And then the second section, I'll just go into what actually we will look at for safe systems of work, some really practical rubber on the road. So I think it was Brendan asked the question earlier about what to do with management. Um, the work health safety inspectors within my team deal with these kinds of issues all the time. So, so let's crack on and have a look at the process for when someone wants to lodge a complaint with Safe Work SA. Thanks, Jason. Now, these are all pictorial. I will talk quickly through them, but if you're on audio, these are pictures of um, of the process, so it's mostly pictorial. So let's say there's a worker named Tony uh, who's at a workplace. He feels that some of the matters within his workplace cross over into a work health safety realm for psychosocial risk. He has tried to resolve it with his workplace, but like Brandon, he's found some problems with management. So Tony's decided to lodge a, a concern with Safe Work SA. So he's gone onto our Safe Work SA website, which is on the on the screen now. He's clicked on Report a Workplace Concern. Thanks, Jason gone down to the little blue button, clicks on that. Thanks, Jason. And it's going to tick on the bottom one, which is psychosocial hazards. That will bring him, thanks, Jason, to a form that looks like this. It's a request for service form. Now we want these, we want Tony to fill this out with as much detail as possible. And we want to know if Tony is happy for us to use his details when we contact the business or the PCBU, as Sam has said. 
Um, so we probably get half and half. Some people would prefer to remain anonymous and there's usually a good reason for that, but we do like to know what that reason is. Obviously, it makes it a lot easier for us if we can use specific details. We also want to know the ABN of the business and Tony can find that on his pay slip. That will help us to link to the right business within our database to see if there is a repeated problem at this workplace. Thanks, Jason. Once Tony submits that form, it goes to our hardworking triage team who will send it off to our team, which is the psychosocial and industrial team. The team leader there will send Tony an acknowledgement email because we understand that people are quite stressed when they do put in a complaint about their employer because they prefer to handle it at the employer level. So the next available inspector will get Tony's request for service form. Thanks, Jason. Sorry I'm going quick, guys, but I know we're a bit short of time. Uh, the allocated inspector will give Tony a ring, get any further details, let him know that we can't share information from the investigation because of a confidentiality of information clause. We will then contact the business, the PCBU, and we'll go out and visit them to discuss what the concerns are. Thanks, Jason. We will then look at what is under the primary duty of care. We have to see that there is provision and maintenance of safe systems of work. So that can look like anything depending on the business and it's up to the inspector to assess the situation and form a reasonable belief. Thank you. Thanks. Next one over. These are examples of safe systems of work, but they can look like anything. So we have to sit down and work out if what the business has in place and is implementing correctly is sufficient to control the risk of psychological injury at that workplace. Thanks, Jason. If we find gaps in the process, what we do is we issue statutory notices, which are legal directions for the business to rectify those issues, which might be manager training, due diligence training, it might be consultation, it might be they need a sexual harassment policy because there's all sorts of nonsense going on at the workplace. Once we're satisfied that, that um, those gaps have been closed, we finalise the file. The file stays on. Thanks, Jason. We finalise the file. It goes through a three-step process to close to make sure we've done it correctly and that file stays on our database in case someone else complains with a similar issue. So that's the life of a psychosocial um, complaint that comes through to Safe Work SA. Now just we've only got a couple of minutes I'll quickly run through how we come to safe systems of work. There was research done uh, about 10 years ago that indicated, thanks Jason, that it is not the person the toxic behaviours at a workplace, it is a failure of the systems of work to manage that behaviour. Thanks, Jason. We would look at a, um, a risk assessment to be done, as has been mentioned. I like the bow tie risk assessment because the critical incident, if you can imagine the knot of the bow tie, we don't want people to get to the critical incident because, as Marty said, it's very difficult to come back from a psychological injury. If we have a look at the left-hand side of the bow tie, those are preemptive controls, and the other side, the right-hand side, is uh, controls that stop the problem from getting worse. But really, there is no coming back from that middle knot issue. So we prefer to stay on the left-hand side. Thanks, Jason. So those are safe systems of work. Yeah, safe systems of work are on that side. Now, I will point out that when businesses who I've gone out to speak to have proudly told me that they've got EAP, so they've got you beauty, they've got it covered. EAP sits on the right-hand side. It's a remedial control. So we want to stay on the left-hand side, which are the safe systems of work. So if we have a look at this one, because we don't have time to go through it all. Um, so we're going to look at behavioural expectations at a workplace. Uh, just as people have expectations at their homes, we also need to have them in a workplace. And that has to apply to managers, not just workers. Managers, workers, clients, parents, if it's a school or childcare centre, people who are calling up, anyone who is involved in that workplace, the business has a responsibility to control the risks. Now, a hazard is something that happens that will not cause a risk of injury, but it tootles along on its own. Might be someone screaming in the car park. No one can see them. No one can hear them. That's a hazard. They bring that behaviour into the workplace. It becomes a risk of injury. That is what needs to be controlled. So um, fairly straightforward there. Methods to direct behavioural expectations. So this would be sort of point one of a safe system of work. So mission statements in, in consultation with workers, your code of conduct, appropriate behaviours policy, anti-bullying, you can read it for yourselves. A very small business can put these into an employee handbook. 
a larger business uh, with multiple levels of management and multiple sites, we would expect uh, separate and more sophisticated policies. We want to see them um, imparted to workers. So consultation, so it looks like we draft the policy, we put it out for consultation. That can look like toolbox talk, email, um, a hard copy in your break room. Two weeks to give us any feedback on that goes back and then becomes the policy for the workplace. It then has to be shared with the workers, training if required, and some of them unfortunately do need training that this is a problem. And then it has to be signed off. We want those signed off annually so that no person in that workplace can say, oh, I didn't realise that that would be offensive. Well, we went through the process, they do realise it's offensive, and then the tie-in can be the disciplinary action. So we can't put up with nonsense like, oh, I didn't realise. Well, you should have realised and that's no excuse. So then we can tie in another safe system of work, which is a disciplinary process. Now, we've run out of time. So I will, if we just flip to the last slide, we have got a fantastic free service here at Safe Work SA. It's our advisory service. The advisors are Katie, Cindy, David, Colleen and Adam. They are a fantastic free resource. On our Safe Work page, if you click onto this area, you can request a visit from one of our advisors and they can walk you through this process and it will be uh, applicable to your business rather than maybe something that's a huge organisation. So please get in touch with them. I'm sorry that was rushed, but we did have that technical glitch. Thank you very much for your attention today. It's really encouraging and any questions can be sent through to us. So thanks, guys. All right, fabulous. Thank you so much, Pam. You've offered some uh, very useful um, and fascinating insights into how we go about our work, particularly around our psychosocial hazard request for service uh, complaint process. So we'd like to finish up now by wrapping up with some practical advice and tips that you can take away with you. Uh, we have responded to, I think, uh, the majority, if not all, of the questions that have been posed so far in the chat. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, hand over to Sam if you'd like to kick us off. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Um, look, um, I'd, I'd be happy for anyone um, in the chat to sort of put in their thoughts about um, let, what they've learned um, throughout this journey as well because I don't, you know, this is just from our perspective. Um, so I'd love to hear what you think as well. Um, but, look, you know, follow the four steps, you know, often, um, I, you know, like I said, um, often organisations will want to sort of get to the pointy end and um, just get going with some control measures, but, you know, really focus um, on, you know, exercising um, a bit of diligence around, um, you know, looking at hazards and trying to define uh, what they are and what sort of impact they might be having for your workers. So that's really critical. So, yeah, that point there, invest time in your problem definition. Um, address the upstream causes of stress, not just the symptoms. You know, as, as Pam just highlighted there, um, you know, just saying, well, we've got um, EAP counselling services, often that's not adequate um, because if somebody requires EAP counselling services because of some adverse um, experiences in a workplace, then really it's kind of the harm may have already been done, okay? And don't just rely on the policies and procedures or they are important, as Pam's just highlighted. Um, you know, they're, they're a bit of a, a cornerstone, but often they're not, um, you know, adequate in, in of themselves. You may need to do something that's a little bit more um, active um, and preventative. And we're here to help. Um, you know, with that wonderful advisory service that, that we have, um, you know, if it's questions that they're not able to answer for you, they will reach in um, to the to the inspectorate um, and we work together um, to help um, businesses and organisations to, you know, um, work their way through the process. So, you know, we'll help you um, and, and return to work South Australia um, a very, very much, um, you know, um, active um, in promoting the same messages as us around work health and safety. Thank you, Sam. Finally, we'd just like to reiterate that 
uh, we have launched a wealth of very helpful new website content on psychosocial risk management. It is available now at safework.sa.gov.au. It includes the hierarchy of risk control uh, that Sam talked to earlier. As Pam mentioned, we have our freely ava available Work Health Safety Advisory Service, and they can provide uh, tailored and targeted support and advice uh, to both workers and businesses. And you can request a visit via the Safe Work SA web address above. Of course, our colleagues at Return to Work SA, uh, there's some very useful information and advice available on their website. In addition, we have the Mentally Healthy Workplaces Services uh, service, which Marty forms part of, in addition to her colleague, Simon Tyler, and you can contact them on that number on the screen or at that email address. I was just looking there, there it looks like there were a few questions around um, risk assessments. Um, I expected we might get people sort of quite interested um, in learning more about that. That's that's good that um, you've highlighted that because um, we, you know, want to think about um, further, um, you know, webinars that we may do in the future to address that, that particular issue. So thank you for that. Mm, absolutely, yes. We are hoping to hold uh, targeted psychosocial risk management specific webinars in the future. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, for, for any further uh, questions or queries that you'd like to send through to Safe Work SA, on the screen there, help.safework.sa.gov.au. Uh, that is one of our key email addresses that you can send through those inquiries to. Uh, we intend to provide a PDF print of the presentation to the attendees of today's webinar. Uh, you have in registering for the event provided your email address, so it's our intention to send them to you uh, shortly uh, post webinar. So I'll just stop sharing my screen and thank you all again for attending uh, today's webinar. We do appreciate it very much. And I'd like to thank our panelists, our presenters, Sam Atkins, uh, Marty Weber from Return to Work SA and Pam Murray. Thank you so much. Uh, the three of you offer a wealth of experience and I'm sure as the audience will have found some very practically useful information uh, advice and support. So thanks to you all for your attention. We do genuinely appreciate it and we hope to provide you all with further information, advice and support over the coming months and years around psychosocial risk management. Thanks again to you all.